It's hotter than a blister bug in a pepper patch. A heat wave is now all around you, and you'll have to be ready for the inevitable. Overexertion, or poor planning, or just plain unlucky. Heat illness is nothing to shake a stick at. The trick is to recognize it for what it is, and where on the spectrum of illness your small patient is smoldering. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Heat-related illnesses span from feeling hot and tired to clinical dehydration, heat exhaustion, syncope, and heat stroke, with a few other findings sprinkled in between. We generate heat from our own metabolism, and in ideal circumstances, we retain it or we get rid of it as needed. Our survival as human beings is relied in large part by how we're able to adapt to our environment by cultivating heat or adjusting what we retain through our clothing or the temperature of our living space. We need an environment that is slightly less warm than our body temp to allow for dissipation. There has to be a downward gradient. When the gradient is smaller, or when we generate more heat than usual, or even worse, if the gradient is reversed, our environment is warmer than we are, we can run into trouble. So, how do we dissipate heat? How do we get rid of it? There are four major mechanisms. Radiation, convection, conduction, and evaporation. We radiate heat all the time through infrared electromagnetic energy. It's how cakes and pies and even you cool down just from the fact that you, or the pie, is warmer than your environment radiation. When you open a window and let the breeze in, you're allowing the transfer of heat to happen into the air current by convection. Air current, convection. If you come into direct contact with a cooler surface, you transfer heat by conduction. And finally, when all of those aren't enough, you may sweat to give off heat through evaporation. Heat's transferred as the water component evaporates it into the atmosphere. Children are particularly susceptible to heat-related illness for quite a few reasons. First, children are metabolic machines. Their high metabolic rate means that they produce more heat per kilogram than the average adult. So, that tank is full of energy. Second, children are more like baseballs than they are like bats. That is, they are rounder than adults. They have a higher body surface area to mass ratio. On a hot summer day, this means they have more body surface available to absorb heat than adults do. Third, the child is a terrible radiator. That is, the child's blood volume is much less than an adult and his cardiac output is lower. They are also not as aerobically conditioned as some adults. All of this makes for an inefficient convection of heat. And finally, children don't sweat as efficiently as adults do. Sweat glands further develop with age and with need. The more you exert yourself as you grow, the more your sweat glands will develop. For this reason, children tend to sweat at higher core temps. This makes them very inefficient at evaporative heat loss. Julian is a three-month-old baby boy who was brought in by his very concerned parents for a terrible rash that they noticed this afternoon. Julian was born full-term, without complications, and he received his two-month vaccine last month. 
no fever, no changes in behavior. He's mostly breastfed with the occasional formula bottle. On arrival, Julian is sleeping comfortably in his car seat, wearing pajamas and a hat. You notice a pile of thick baby blankets forming a little cotton igloo to the side. His vital signs are normal, and you examine his anterior chest, his lungs, and his abdomen while he's nice and comfy and cozy where he is. His lungs are clear. He has no increased work of breathing. But you do see a raised, red, fine, papular rash, especially in the upper chest, neck, armpits, and diaper area. Hmm, it really does look nasty. You double-check. No petechiae. No cellulitis. No tenderness to palpation. There's normal cap refill. The child doesn't appear to be particularly bothered by it, but now that he's awake, he does seem a bit fussy, but easily consolable to mother. You do a thorough head-to-toe exam. You even recheck his temperature. It's all still normal. He's taking a bottle nicely now that he's awake. Your history is very benign. You finish up your physical exam, and it's all normal, except for that ugly-looking rash. You don't have much you can think of to be worried about, but you're still left with this red, prickly rash that looks much worse than the patient does. He is very well-appearing, and you're a bit taken back, and then you remember the polar expedition gear all around him and also it's a nice summer day outside so you ask mom and dad is it a bit warmer than usual in your home yes they have fans on constantly okay next question how do you dress little julian at home the same head to toe covered with a sleep sack for naps well what do you all wear at home t-shirts, and shorts. Mm. After an exhaustive H&P and a well child, you've got your answer. Miliaria rubra. Okay, not to be so fancy, it's just plain old heat rash, also called prickly heat. It may freak you out in a small child, but they are actually the ones who are more susceptible to it. Julian's mom and dad were just trying to be careful with him and keep him warm and cozy. I tell parents that after the neonatal period, so after the first month, they should dress their children as heavily or as lightly as they feel comfortable. I give people a pass the first month because there's some water weight loss and adjusting to feeding within the first couple weeks and month. Usually by the second month, the child is gaining weight and we see some reserve that steadily improves with the child's growth and age. So poor Julian was a little baby slow cooker. His sweat ducts, his eccrine glands, as immature as they are, were clogged. Eccrine duct inflammation or obstruction can happen to anyone, but think about hot, especially humid conditions. Older bed-bound patients or small infants or even athletes after prolonged activity. Miliaria comes from the Latin milia, which means millet. It's a small type of grain. So imagine taking out a pot of red hot small millet grains and throwing it up against someone's skin. You got miliaria. Julian has miliaria rubra, so red miliaria, also called heat rash or prickly heat. There are different types of miliaria depending on how deep the sweat gland obstruction is. So you have miliaria crystallina, rubra, profunda, or even a complication, pustulosa. Miliaria crystallina is an obstruction of the sweat glands just at the surface, in the stratum corneum, in the epidermis. These papules are small and, well, they're crystalline. They're white or opaque, like tiny drops of perspiration just trying to get out. Other people describe it as tiny pinpoint blisters, and we're talking one to two millimeters here, usually in the areas that are most likely to get overheated. Since this is such a superficial obstruction of the eccrine glands, miliaria papules will often brush off with the slightest friction, 
which is important to bring out to the parents so that they're not alarmed. Miliaria crystallina is not pruritic, and it's the mildest of the miliaria types. Miliaria rubra develops with a blockage deeper to the epidermis. Again, papular red lesions about one to two millimeters. There is more inflammation involved here. There's redness and possibly some pruritus. Remember the layers of the skin? From superficial to deep, the epidermis starts with the stratum corneum. That's what flakes off after scratching your skin. Then the stratum lucidum and the active stratum granulosum deep to that, then deeper the stratum spinosum, and finally the germinative stratum basale, then the dermis. Now, this is just for extra super bonus points, but if you ever need to stun a dermatologist just long enough for him to give you a follow-up appointment, the deepest layers together are called the Malpighian layer, M-A-L-P-I. G-H-I-A-N, Malpighian layer. Eccrine duct obstruction causes inflammation, rubor, and miliaria rubra. Grazie Marcello Malpighi, he's the 17th century father of histology. Going deeper, you may see the miliaria profunda, caused by an obstruction in the dermis itself. Since this is so deep, you may not see much redness. It's smoother and flesh-colored. Miliaria profunda is more lumpy-bumpy than red and angry-looking. It's also called tropical anhydrosis because it's more of a chronic issue. Multiple bouts of poor acclimatization causing potentially miliaria rubra can eventually lead to further obstruction, miliaria profunda. And the presentation is a little different. You feel severe burning and itching. Think about this in your teen or your adolescent patient who's just really uncomfortable and often very dramatically itchy and you don't see much other than a flesh-colored, fine, lumpy, bumpy skin that honestly feels worse than it looks to you. Ask about chronic overheating or previous bouts of prickly rash. And as if you haven't had your miliaria fill, one more. Miliaria pustulosa. This, it's simply pustulosis. It's a complication of another pre-existing dermatitis with bacterial superinfection causing pustules. Rarely this is a complication from another miliaria, and it's more often from another condition. You often don't need treatment other than follow-up, and if it's severe and long-standing, potentially antimicrobials. So, what do we do about prickly heat? Miliaria rubra, or its milder form, Miliaria crystallina, a more superficial obstruction, really, it's treating the underlying cause. They need to air out. Now, I guarantee you that if you tell this to someone with a terribly rashy-looking skin, they will not be so amused. It is the truth, and... Often, it's best to do less when we're talking about obstruction of the sweat glands, other than modifying behavior and some symptomatic control. You can try to talk with them that the rash will only get better by keeping the skin cool and ventilated. You could also treat the symptoms in the meantime with calamine lotion. It can be used to soothe the itching. And you can even use a very mild topical corticosteroid for severe cases. But again, you want to do as much of nothing as possible since you really want to encourage those glands to re-regulate themselves, to open up and drain. And it's hard to do that when they're lathered in emollients. Wet, cool compresses are great. And I would especially recommend those if you're using the topical agent. You really want to clear off that agent as soon as possible. Another skin finding you may see in older patients is heat edema. Now, truthfully, it's mostly in the elderly, but I've seen quite a few overweight or obese teens with this. If you're not acclimatized or conditioned and your body over relies on vasodilation to cool, it may pool. And then you see some vasodilatory edema and inflammation that goes into the third space. 
So this overreaction causes interstitial fluid to leak from capillary beds, and it looks a lot like a fluid overload from congestive heart failure, except there are no respiratory symptoms. The, your heart and lung exam are normal. Get a good history, do a good exam, and they may just need to cool it. Josiah is a two-year-old boy whose mom brings him in today because he's just too tired. She describes him as a little terror who runs around morning to night, but today is just fussy and low energy and not wanting to take anything by mouth. After a little more history, you find out that they spent the day outside at a family party under the hot sun. The mother is very helpful with information, and truthfully, it's not a medical mystery that he's gotten too much sun exposure. He was sweating quite a bit earlier, and he's still a little diaphoretic as he arrives to the ED. On exam, his lips look dry. His capillary refill is three to four seconds. This is real dehydration. He's able to attend to you for just long enough to find you annoying. So, not altered. Anyway, his heart rate is 140 beats per minute, just lying there. His BP is normal. His respiratory rate is slightly elevated at 30, and his temp is 37.8. Josiah has heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion is part of the spectrum that starts with mild complaints like rash or edema, to systemic signs and symptoms like heat exhaustion to heat syncope and eventually heat stroke. The main parameters that separate the mostly benign heat exhaustion from everything else is a normal temp to only slightly high, so less than 40 degrees Celsius, normal mental status, and normal blood pressure. With heat exhaustion, you're dehydrated and, well, exhausted. You'll see patients complain of headache, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, dizziness, and severe thirst. It's almost like an acute flu. The younger you are, the more susceptible you are to hypernatremia. In Josiah's case, he has dry lips, delayed capillary refill, he's tachycardic, and overall doesn't really look that great to you. Now, he's already nauseated, so you're not going to get that far with oral rehydration, although in general, the official recommendations are to try something PO first. If you have an electrolyte-containing oral rehydration solution, you can try that, or a Pedia-Pop. Okay, you tried. Josiah is really fussy, and poor guy, he's only two. He's probably nauseated, and his refusal to take PO is the way that he's showing you that. You give him a 20 ml per kilo bolus of normal saline, and he's brighter and now wants to drink. By the way, if you felt that he had a prolonged period of no oral intake, or if you happen to know that he had maybe ketones in his urine, feel free to give D5NS, so dextrose with NS as a bolus. D5NS can break the ketosis while you rehydrate the child. Now, you may send electrolytes or not. My only caution is to be careful what you wish for. What are you really going to do with that sodium of 143? Or that bicarb of 21? Or any other value that may be just slightly off? If you're not planning to keep them, you may not want to start making that discharge even harder than it has to be. Do your good thorough HMP. If there's a reason to send for labs, go for it, and follow up with selective testing, as you see fit. Jade is a seven-year-old girl who was out all day at a barbecue in the park. She was running all around with the cousins when, in the early afternoon, she went to her mother complaining of pain in her legs. She would rub them repeatedly while she chomped on a cupcake. 
Mom thought she was looking for some attention and sent her off to go play some more. At some point, she had an episode where Mom described it as she just laid down on the floor. She wasn't particularly exerting herself. You made sure to clarify that part. Her mom thought that she may have looked a little pale, and you're starting to get the impression that mom is a little bit of a minimizer. She calls her daughter dramatic. You piece together mother's description, and another way to look at it is that poor Jade effectively syncopized on the grass. Mother gave her some juice. She seemed to do better, but by the time the afternoon was closing, she was a droopy, sad little girl who was now refusing to walk. On exam, her temp is 38.1, heart rate 133, blood pressure 105 over 65, respiratory rate 30. She's tired. She answers any questions with shrugged shoulders or one-word answers. Jade is dehydrated and, well, heat exhausted. You interpret what happened earlier as heat syncope. People who go out to outdoor concerts or even stand in hot churches get church syncope. So you get venous pooling in the extremities in an already overly vasodilated person and, yep, they go to ground. Heat syncope is really just the terminal end of heat exhaustion. Patients have dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, and they may pass out briefly. To be good old run-of-the-mill heat syncope, you really have to qualify for heat exhaustion. So temp under 40 degrees Celsius, no hypotension, no altered mental status. You treat the syncope as part of the heat exhaustion. Since this is a more severe presentation of heat exhaustion, I'll often get electrolytes and go straight for IV fluids, although theoretically you could still try oral rehydration first. Her complaints of leg pain, remember that? Those were heat cramps, typically seen in the large muscle groups like the quadriceps, the calves, sometimes in the arms, and rarely in the abdominal muscles. Heat cramps can be very uncomfortable. You want to replete their electrolytes as needed, and you could consider giving magnesium, IV, if severe. For example, the football player who comes in with pain after overexertion. You may consider sending a total creatinine kinase and chemistry panel to risk stratify the patient for rhabdomyolysis. If the athlete comes in with severe pain, then IV fluids, magnesium, and even potentially a benzodiazepine. Just a little note before we leave heat exhaustion and its spectrum. Let's talk about heat tetany. Now, this is not too common, just to be honest, but it can happen in athletes, especially who push themselves. An early finding of heat illness is hyperventilation. You're trying to pant off all that heat from your insensible losses in your moist breath. All of our patients so far today have been a little hyperpnic, and that only works for so long. And if you're that involved in your heat illness, at some point, the prolonged hyperventilation causes a respiratory alkalosis, very similar to patients with a panic attack. And you may have a patient complaining of perioral or digital numbness or tingling from a transient drop in serum calcium. Further on this spectrum, of course, would be carpopedal spasm. You may have a positive hostic sign. That is when you percuss the facial nerve where it's the most superficial, just anterior to the tragus, the transient hypokalemia from hyperventilation causes twitching of the facial muscles. The hypocalcemic environment makes them hyper excitable and even your light percussion sets off the muscles associated with the nerve. Hwostek sign, named after František Hwostek, was a Czech physician. He was a renowned humanistic clinician and a writer in the 1800s, and we can thank him for his sign. Or maybe you're just doing routine vital signs and you're checking your patient's blood pressure and you may see a hyperflexion of the wrist and metacarpals called the Trousseau sign, named after another physician in the 1800s, Armand Trousseau, a French physician innovator. He was the first in La Belle France to perform a tracheotomy. Trousseau was also the physician to coin the term aphasia. So there you have it. 
He also coined the term form frust, the rough form, the crude or incomplete form. Now, we don't use this particular term very much in medicine anymore, but it encapsulates what we see daily. Form frust is the atypical presentation of disease or a partial presentation of an entity. Everything fits the textbook, but not just that. It's it's not a smooth, complete picture. It's a crude picture. It's a form frust. Form pleine is the full form. It's the textbook presentation. Form pleine. You don't have to know the words. Just know the concept that someone in the 1800s was feeling your pain already. Emile came to the ED with weakness, and on taking a blood pressure, he really didn't have carpal spasm, but when you tapped on his facial nerve, he had that twitching, so Emile had a forme frust of hypocalcemia. La forme pleine would be if he had all findings of hypocalcemia. So, Rostec sign on the face, Trousseau's sign with a BP cup, forme frust. Use it in a sentence today for extra credit. Mais je digresse, I digress. After you ensure yourself that the patient's symptoms are just due to hyperventilation, you can put a non-rebreather mask on, but just don't turn on the O2. Some people elect to place it at a very, very low flow, like 2 to 5 liters per minute, but it's really not enough to really deliver any important amount of O2. You know that the non-rebreather mask needs 10 to 15 liters per minute to be effective. So anyway, you're putting on the non-rebreather mask, not so much to get O2, but so much that the child can rebreathe his or her CO2. It's really a fancy way of giving them a round paper bag to breathe into. Jamie is a 15-year-old boy who just started football camp. It's getting real. Coach has them out drilling in full gear, and somebody was late in bringing the water today. You see where this is going. Jamie scrimmaged all morning long, and when he went down to sit for his lunch break, he collapsed and is brought in by EMS confused, almost delirious. He has a hard time attending to what you're saying. He's red, hot, flushed. You get him on the gurney and get him into a hospital gown. There's no trauma. On the monitor, his heart rate is 155. His blood pressure is 92 over 50. His respiratory rate is 32. And his temp? 41.5 degrees Celsius. What do we do now? Well, until now, we've talked all about supportive care. Get the child out of the hot environment. Make sure there's some ventilation, there's rehydration, etc. This is not heat exhaustion. Yes, he syncopies, but he didn't wake up normal. He's altered. He's hypotensive. He's severely dehydrated. And the coup de grace? He's hyperthermic. Jamie needs rapid cooling now. This is heat stroke. His body is denaturing. If left unchecked, he could develop ARDS, rhabdomyolysis, hepatic injury, disseminated intravascular coagulation, GI bleed, you name it. Remember, all of the enzymes and processes that ensure homeostasis require a normal pH and a reasonable core temperature. Without either of those, you're toast. Rapid cooling is the name of the game. Let's use all of the means that we have at our disposal. Remember when we talked about the ways to slow down heat loss causing overheating? We can use this to our advantage to get him cooled down. Radiation, convection, conduction, and evaporation. Radiation, get those clothes off. He can more efficiently exchange infrared energy to the environment if we can get all those heavy clothes off of him. Convection. Grab a fan. Get the cool air current working for you. Our own fearless leader keeps one in her office for just these patients. Conduction. Ice packs to hot areas. We're talking groin, armpit. We need to conduct that heat away. And evaporation. Cool water on the skin to help the convection process. Use what you got and do what you can with it. 
Another option, of course, is to use the commercially available cooling blankets, but I find that they take some time to set up and to me, they're better at keeping someone cool or warm. They're just not great at rapidly cooling them. Here, low tech is best, in my opinion. Now, while we're doing that, get two large bore IVs in and give boluses of cooled saline. Ice water immersion, of course, is probably the best modality, and feel free to use it in the pre-hospital setting before you arrive, but it's just too difficult and dangerous to keep a patient monitored when they're floating in ice. Since this is a multi-organ system disease and patients are at risk for failure, a full panel of CBC, chemistry, UA, CK, LFTs, and coagulation studies are important. Keep your differential diagnosis wide open and look into co-ingestions of street drugs or alcohol in the appropriate context. Is, if the patient's altered more than his temp may suggest, CT his head because was it the chicken or the fried egg? Did he have a traumatic or atraumatic brain bleed and then fall and become exposed to the elements? Remember that antipyretics don't work for heat-related illness. They work on the hypothalamus to reset your baseline temp. The problem here is that you're a heat sink. We have to get that heat off of you mechanically and physically. Rapid cooling may also trick your hypothalamus and other physiologic regulators and cause shivering, even when you're still hot. You need to keep cooling, but shivering itself will produce heat. So if needed, you can give small aliquots of benzodiazepines to prevent shivering. All right, you got this. It's not every day you'll see a heat stroke or heat coma. You'll know the patient is sick, and if he's altered or has a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius or above, you're going to get cracking. Sick? Cool him fast. But just to keep it real, most of the time you'll see heat illness on a wide spectrum, and the key will be to risk stratify them in your mind, figure out who is dehydrated, who can take PO, who may need labs, and most importantly, who may actually have sepsis or meningitis or novel drug ingestion or something else. That is our value. Trying to work out the signal from the noise, the mirage from the reflection off the asphalt. So when you're caring for someone in the heat illness, heat exhaustion, heat syncope spectrum, or even something less concerning like heat cramps or miliaria or heat edema, if you just send them on their way, they might not get much out of this visit. Listen, they've shown up, incurred the cost of a visit, you've invested your time and effort and brain power, the tuition's already paid, might as well get the lesson. Give your good precautionary advice, your anticipatory guidance. Any child who comes in within the spectrum of heat-related illness, this is in a way a sentinel event. It should not happen again, and it's almost always completely preventable. So what are some of the things to consider when you're counseling your little red hot potato family and you want to keep them out of the oven again? Some of this is just common sense. Now, if you want to be literary about it, thanks to Rudyard Kipling and later Noel Coward, only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun or more down to earth. Some would say, it's so hot and dry, the trees are bribing the dogs. In any event, it's so tempting to go outside when it's looking so nice and bright. Everybody knows the dangers of heat and dehydration, but when the time comes, no one seems to pay no never mind. To help illustrate a point to anyone, in any context, it helps to use something specific, something concrete. That's why idioms and folk sayings work so well, and why you probably still have an image of a sad-looking tree hoping a dog will come by to visit. Anyway, if we're talking about a young child, 
you can focus on the fact that the child will follow the parent's lead and rarely ask for water or ask to go inside until it's really late in the game and the harm is done. Or if this is an older child, you may focus your discussion with the fact that, sure, you can go out in warm weather, that's fine, just do it in the very early morning, for sure before lunch, and maybe later on in the evening, just before or after supper. Now, this sounds a little pedantic and simple, and you would assume everybody knows, but the weight that we have as physicians really carries, and people appreciate it when we take the time to highlight the importance of prevention. It shows that we care. It shows that we care about them after they leave the hospital. You can talk about proper clothing, covering up skin, using sunscreen, limiting outdoor time, frequent opportunities to hydrate, even programmed into the scheduled fun. All of that helps. Remember, of course, that humidity is a big deal here. That's why high temps in the dry desert are not as oppressive as moderate temps in humidity. The reason goes back to our concepts of heat retention and offloading, radiation, convection, conduction, evaporation, repetition. It's the mother of memory. Anyway, in hot, dry climates, you have the advantage of evaporation. There is a gradient in the moisture content between your perspiring skin and the ambient air. It makes for a quicker evaporation, literally offloading your heat sink by the warm vapor that you exude, that you get rid of. In humid climates, you have one of your heat dissipating modalities really not available to you. Evaporation is very slow. That's why people in dry desert like Phoenix, Arizona can handle temps of 100 or 110 degrees Fahrenheit, so 38 to 43 degrees Celsius. It's because the average humidity there is only 35%. But in a place like Atlanta, hot Atlanta, with a temperature of only 80 to 90 degrees, so 27 to 32 degrees Celsius, but with a humidity of up to 70%, it feels hotter than Satan's house cat. There's a lot that goes into relative humidity and the dew index And I'm no expert at this. I just use my common sense and try to illustrate for the family some things to keep in mind. In athletes, they have to be even more careful and exact. There are all kinds of things that can be done, like acclimatization. They can figure out who is a salt loser and who needs supplements. All kinds of great things that the sports medicine doctor can help with. Now, I mention this in case you come across a very passionate soccer or football family who is determined to push forward. There may be a lot of questions, and you can refer them to the American College of Sports Medicine website or their own primary care doctor. One important note for the overexerted athlete with heat illness, you know that if you don't lay down the law, they are going right back on that field, right? So think of the heat-related illness in the athlete like you do when you counsel athletes after a concussion. No exercise for a week after this heat-related illness. You have to see your medical team. Maybe that's your medical director of the team or your own physician to be cleared for return to play. The athlete will then start training, hopefully in a cool environment, ideally indoors, and only over time, and we're talking weeks, you can eventually go back to the conditions that contributed to this heat-related illness. I'm not going to want to hear this, but if you lay down the law and explain a pretty bleak story about their return, they may do half of what we ask them to. Now, this seems very severe, but it's safe. Pan frying your brain is not so safe. I don't harbor any belief that the official recommendations will be followed to the letter, but you're doing everyone a favor by laying out a draconian approach to no sports for you. It makes the follow-up much more palatable and emphasizes the gravity of the situation. Heat-related illness can be life-threatening. Even scarier is that the spectrum is wide. It's hard to differentiate between levels, and all of that cloudiness gets murkier when the coach says, get going.
Athletes and their families are so motivated to get back to play that I want to go over a few myths and legends about heat-related illness. It'll help in your discussions. First, you stop sweating before you even get overheated. Wrong. Most people with heat stroke collapse in a pool of sweat. Don't use that as your guide. Second myth, you got to be dehydrated to get overheated. Wrong. Dehydration is bad and so is overheating. They often go together, but they don't need each other. Just like a full kettle of water can boil, so can an otherwise reasonably hydrated person. Third myth, if they have a normal mental status, then they should probably just walk it off. No. Some people have a lucid interval that can make them seem okay. Do that full H&P. And lastly, I feel fine. Put me back in, coach. No, no play for you. All right, let's cool this down. You're finishing off a long, hard shift, feeling bundled up by all kinds of PPE. You're showered. You're now relaxing at home, and you revel on the clink, clink, clink of ice barreling down a tall glass. The whoosh of a cold drink circling around those ice-cold cubes, condensation already cooling your fingers, as you take a long, cool waft of that life-giving substance. <sighs> okay, cool down now? Guided imagery isn't just for procedural sedation, my friend. Anyway, now that we're cool and relaxed, let's recap. Radiation, convection, conduction, evaporation. We try to do it early and often. Humidity can get in the way. Heat-related illness is a spectrum, and it can be tricky to find the signposts. Heat exhaustion is a child, adolescent, or adult who is tired, likely dehydrated, maybe has a little tachycardia, maybe a little bit of tachypnea, but heat exhaustion includes a normal blood pressure and a normal mental status. This still will include heat syncope as long as they're normal when they wake up again. Other bothersome conditions are miliaria, heat cramps, and even heat tetany. Supportive care, minor cooling measures, and ideally PO hydration will get you most of the way. If you're concerned, you can check a sodium, a creatinine, and a total CK. Heat stroke is differentiated by an abnormal mental status, and that could just be drowsiness. The cutoff for heat stroke is 40 degrees Celsius. The child or adult may have multi-organ system failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, hepatic injury, disseminated intravascular coagulation, rhabdomyolysis. Cool them down fast. Check that CBC, chem panel, LFTs, coag studies, and a total CK. For those going home, precautionary advice and treating this as a sentinel event will keep your young patient safe and hopefully prevent a catastrophe in the making. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.